Bishop O'Connell, welcome thank to St. Charles. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for coming. On behalf of everyone here, wanted to thank you for coming and happy feast day. Thank you. You know, know that you're of incension yourself, so uh, some of the questions we wanted to ask particular uh, relate to that specifically. Uh, could you tell me a bit about your own vocation and the impact Vincentians have had on your life and what inspired you to become a Vincentian? Sure. When I was a young man, I, of course, being from the Archdiocese of Philadelphia, uh, the only place I thought of was St. Charles because that's where everybody went mm -hmm. as a seminarian. And uh, I was looking forward to that. We came to visit here at St. Charles often from my parish, and so that was the plan. Mm -hmm. And then I went to what we had in those days were these things that were called vocation fairs. And they were sponsored by the Sarah Club. Okay. And all these priests and sisters came from all over in their distinctive habits and everything. And they set up booths and the auditoriums of the schools. And all the kids would go around from table to table and collect all the literature and then throw it out after they left, you know. Yeah. Uh, but I had literature from the Vincentians. And... Uh, so I got on the school bus, and when I sat down, there was a, underneath me an ad for the Vincentians. So I took it and I filled it out. And I didn't know the difference between the Vincentians and anybody else. Mm -hmm. And the Vincentians wrote back to me and invited me to come to visit the seminary. And that's how it started. I, I, I got my vocation that way. Wow. And how old were you when that happened? When I went to the minor seminary, so I was 13 years old when I went wow. to the minor. And the minor seminary was in Princeton, New Jersey. Okay. So it was not that far from my parents' home. So the formation uh, time back then was different. Like you, you went to school as a young kid. For... It was a high school, what would be called a high school seminary. Uh. So we had a traditional high school education, mm. but there was more... Uh, religious activity, more prayers and masses and spiritual reading. Everybody had a spiritual director. And so uh, the idea was you went there with a the thought that you would become a priest. Right. And so the, the whole education was geared in that direction. And I, I went there in 1969. So it's a while ago. And the seminary itself, St. Joseph's Prep Seminary, it was called in Princeton, has long since closed. Uh, and our seminary, we, we don't have a minor seminary in the Vincentians anymore. Mm -hmm. But we did at that time, and that's how I got to know a lot of the Vincentians and came to love the Vincentian community and get to know a lot about St. Vincent de Paul and came to love him too. Awesome. Yeah, I, uh, I've been learning more about St. Vincent de Paul myself, um, and particularly for someone who's discerning priesthood, uh, what he initially entered the priesthood for, I, I heard, was that he wanted to have a comfortable life, and at that time, things weren't uh, it wasn't a good situation in France, and apparently his dad helped him a lot with getting to yeah, become a priest. And Saint Vincent was a, uh, uh, a kind of a shepherd boy. Mm. Uh, his family was not poor. Mm -hmm. Many people describe it as though he came from a poor family. They were not poor. They were landowners, yeah. and he worked the land, and uh, uh, very smart. And he came to the attention of his priest, his parish priest, who made sure that St. Vincent had an education. And he enabled him to get the education. And St. Vincent saw the life of some priest was a good life. And Vincent was eager to become a priest so that he could get a benefice. Yeah. In those days, benefice was attached to parishes. And so when you went to a parish, you kind of received uh, compensation over and above what you would ordinarily receive. And so Vincent was very attracted to that, wanted to get that benefice, wanted to be able to take care of his parents in their old age. And so his motives were not the purest in the beginning. Right. I, and from there, I heard his dad actually came to visit him at one point, and he didn't show up in good attire and good shape, and uh, St. Vincent turned him Vincent away. Vincent see him. He yeah. was embarrassed by him. Yeah, and that, I heard, was part of... Uh, a change for him afterward reflecting upon it um, and so like not wanting to you know we we're becoming priests to ultimately serve you know the people that are in need our brothers and sisters and just realizing like the reasons that he maybe initially had towards going to priesthood uh, God God used 
you know, what he went through to con convert him and change his ministry. And I don't think the conversion happened until after he was ordained. Okay. It was later in his life. Mm -hmm. uh, St. Vincent was um, uh, only 20 when mm -hmm. he was ordained. Oh. He was below the can canonical age for being validly ordained priest. And he actually tricked the Bishop of Perigo into ordaining him. And the Bishop thought he was older than he was. Oh. And he ordained him. Vincent said his first Mass by himself. And then he went off to uh, his assignment. And he had a very interesting life story. Um, but Vincent's, Vincent's conversion really occurred uh, after he was a priest. He, was, he got himself a job working as a chaplain on the estate of a very wealthy family, the de Gandhi family. And uh, one day someone came to him to go to confession and told Vincent that he hadn't been to confession for decades. And St. Vincent asked him, are there many others like this? And the man told him, there are many people like this. And they all started to come to St. Vincent. And St. Vincent realized that there was something much more important than just having a benefice or just having an important job. Right. And that's how his conversion started to take place. Right. That's beautiful. And, you know, he's there specifically as a priest to help those souls. So it's like God willed it all for a reason. God okay. always works that way in all of yeah. our lives. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, speaking of this, uh, what is it like being a bishop and forming young men to be priests? And how important is this mission, is this mission for the diocese and to you personally? Yeah, you know, I, I, I've had a very interesting priestly life, you know. Mm. Most men, when they're ordained, they're assigned to a parish. Uh, I was not. I, I went to a parish for a very brief time after ordination and then went to teach in a high school. I was transferred quickly because I had to replace someone who was transferred in the high school. And so I w started out as a high school teacher and I loved it, enjoyed it, enjoyed it uh, very much. Uh, I worked here in the Archdiocese of Philadelphia at Archbishop Wood High School for Boys in Warminster. And uh, really was planning on doing that for a long time when my superior came to me and he asked me to go study and I was sent to study canon law. And uh, I had no plans to study canon law at all. And I asked him, I said, why are you sending me to study canon law? And he said to me, because you're the only one in your class, you're the only priest 10 years in either direction that knows Latin well enough. I'm, Latin was my best subject in school. So, oh, wow. so I went and studied because canon law is written, the code is in Latin originally. And, uh, I studied it and, and, and I enjoyed it. I loved studying canon law and I went to Catholic University in Washington, D.C. And I came back and I taught in the seminary in, uh, in Allentown, in the Vincentian Seminary. And I taught there for a couple of years. And then my superiors sent me to St. John's University in New York to be the dean. And so St. John's at the time was the largest Catholic university in the country. And my school, the School of Arts and Sciences, was the largest school within the largest university. And so I was there for about nine years. I loved it. I enjoyed working there in that capacity. And then uh, one day I got a call. Uh, would you consider going to Catholic University as president? And I just, I said, yeah, oh, sure. Well, I didn't take it seriously, you know. And then all of a sudden I found out I was elected. And so I went to Catholic U. I was there for 12 years. Years, So I've had an interesting life, but most of my life has been in education, in works of education. During my time at Catholic U, because it's the Bishop's University, I got to know a lot of bishops and uh, people who were in uh, positions of uh, importance or authority in the church, including one Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger. Well, and I became friendly with him, and then all of a sudden he becomes the Pope. And... Uh, one day I got a phone call after about 12 years at Catholic U saying, uh, I want you to be the Bishop of Trenton, and I'm not asking you. <laughs> so that's how I got to Trenton and to be the Bishop of Trenton. Of course, when you're the Bishop, you're responsible for fostering and nurturing vocations uh, to your diocese. And even though I was at Incension, 
once you become the bishop of a diocese, then your attention shifts to the diocese which you're assigned to. Yeah. Well, thank you for answering the call, whether it was forced or not. Um, no, it wasn't forced, you know. <laughs> I think he was just, that was just uh, his way of yeah, I, getting I got you. Because we, as I said, because we knew each other. So. Well, it's, it's pretty cool to know that you, you had a good friendship with Pope Benedict. <laughs> it was a good, good, you know, every time I went to, I probably have been to Rome maybe 26 or 27 times. Well, and during my years at Catholic University, I used to go to Rome twice a year. In fact, it was Joseph Ratzinger, who was the one that approved my becoming the president of Catholic University. Oh, wow. So we had some, uh, some connection that way. And then when I would go to visit Rome, I always made a point of stopping every time. Made a point of stopping and talking to him, sometimes for a long time, sometimes for a short time. Yeah. So I'm sure that because of all, all the bishops and people that I knew, uh, that uh, I got somehow recommended for, to become a bishop. Not particularly where I went, but to become a bishop. And, you know, these, these appointments are kind of mysterious. You don't know how it happens. Yep. I just presume there was a list of names given to the Pope, and he looked at that and said, oh, I know that one. <laughs> and that's probably how I got the assignment. <laughs> I'm sure it was more than that, but... <clears throat> and, you know, of course, God playing a part in that, so... Yeah. Uh, happy that it worked out that way. It was a good way to work out, and thanks yeah. be to God, then I got a chance to meet you. <laughs> that's right. Amen. Um, so why is uh, St. Charles a place that you trust to send your guys to? Is there, besides your history being a Philadelphia guy, is there anything about the, the history, the tradition, the staff here that it makes it a special place, a, a place where you know you can trust sending course, guys so all, to? Before meeting the Vincentians, all the priests I know were priests of Philadelphia, mm. and they all went to St. Charles Seminary. And so they talked about it, they joked about it, they had stories about their... their so, so St. Charles was always part of my mind and part of my attention. Mm. Um, I knew the priests of Philadelphia, they were good men, good priests. Mm. And my experience of, of the priests that I knew in the course of my life was always positive, was always very, very good. So when I became a bishop, the diocese was sending our seminarians to several different places, actually five seminaries. But we didn't have that many seminarians. And so I wanted to try to reduce the number of seminarians so that the seminaries themselves could get to know one another as they started their formation and training. St. Charles was always in my mind, so I decided that would be one place I sent them. And then the other place I sent them, uh, decided to send them was Mount St. Mary's in Emmitsburg. But I had been there briefly in the parish there early in my career, so I knew that place very well. So these were two places that I was very, very familiar with. And they're two very, very good places. But St. Charles always had a very fine reputation, and the product was always a wonderful, good product. Right. I was going to say what you said at Mass today about the forming of a priest being a, a masterpiece and how, how hard that work actually is. Uh, I mean, it, it takes... There's a lot that goes into the formation of the priest. Well, that's so, what St. Vincent said. There's nothing yes. greater in the world, no greater masterpiece right. than the formation of a good priest. Yeah, so the people that are here and trusting the people to that work and not just the discernment, the formation, um, it is ultimately like the people you're surrounded by that help you to become who you're supposed to be, you know, that's to become true. a good priest. So um, I know I'm thankful <laughs> to be here and can tell it's been very formative for me, so... Uh, we have wonderful faculty, and I know yeah. many of the priests here and have known them for a long time, and they're just good men, and they do a good job. And, you know, being in formation, do, doing the work of formation is a hidden work, right? and many times a thankless work, because the priests here are not out in a parish and are not out with people all the time. They're working here. They're working behind the scenes for the training of the clergy. Uh, but they do such a wonderful job here, and they, they're good formators. They help our seminarians grow in their spiritual life, as well as provide them with a very good, solid academic preparation for the priesthood. Yeah. And that's really, uh, in my mind, the most important thing for yeah. our seminarians, spiritual life and academic preparation. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I can testify to those being two 
very uh, solid things being here. And um, like I said, I I can tell uh, you've you've made a good decision <laughs> Cho choosing where to send your guys. I've been to the Mount too, and it's definitely a good place. And uh, yeah, it's a good place. Yeah, um, and I think one of the special things about St. Charles is the fraternity. Um, and I know within our own amongst the seminarians for Trenton, there's a special fraternity, and you can see that with the priests, um, just the way we're bonded together. And you get a priests, when they visit the Diocese of Trenton, like if they come to give a talk or are involved, uh, they always make the comment how wonderfully rich the fraternity is among the priests of Trenton. And that's a wonderful thing to be able to say, and it's certainly inspiring to those young men who yeah. want to become part of that diocese as priests. Absolutely, yeah. Um, I think that goes a long way uh, to someone who is seeking to answer the call when you have brothers that are about the same things and you feel like part of a family, you know, working towards the same things. Uh, that is something that uh, it, it gives extra motivation and encouragement. Um, so yeah, I, I know I'm, I feel like I'm where I'm supposed to be, uh, the people I've met here and uh, the staff and everything, I, I feel like I have the right people around me. So. Yeah. And, and when you, when will you be ordained, please God? Uh well, I think it'd be around twenty twenty nine. So how many years is that from now? I'm at college three, so six more after this one. Good, because I have seven more years before I have to retire. <laughs> Actually it would be five more, so Good. I'll be within well, the Well I'll catch you in my net. <laughs> that's that's good. <laughs> I would I would be happy. <laughs> um so one of the last things I wanted to ask, um do you have any advice for seminarians or men actively discerning the priesthood? Yes, I do. The first one was to be men of prayer. Don't neglect that. It's mm. the easiest thing to neglect, especially when you become a priest, especially young priests, very active, doing many, many things, have many things pulling at you. Don't neglect your prayer life. That's the most important part of your life. And that's really what you give to people, right. the fruit of your prayer. Also, your studies. You, you're not only just a priest, you're a priest who has something to offer. And what you offer is the fruit of what you learn, you're the theology, the scripture, learning how to preach, to preach well, uh, and to prepare yourselves to interact with people in a pastoral way. Uh, those are very important things. But prayer and study and fraternity. Enjoy your seminary years and enjoy one another. It's a great time of life. It is. Yeah, and that's great advice. Thank you. Um, I do want to, I have one bonus question if you don't mind. Um, do you have any like special stories from your time, whether as a bishop or before, where like you've had a special uh, experience, Jesus working through your ministry, maybe like uh, someone being healed or just someone converting, uh, something you would maybe consider miraculous or just a powerful witness of Christ working through you? Um. I wouldn't say anything miraculous, no. Mm -hmm. My life, even though I've had many different types of jobs, is, is a lot of ordinary experiences. I wouldn't say there's anything miraculous. But I have often felt, especially in times when people came to me with problems or difficulties, that I was able to say something to them that made a difference. And I don't know who sometimes where that came from, where the idea came from. And I do believe it's God working through me, God working through us as priests. Yeah. Well, that's, that's special to be able to help in knowing God's doing that through you. And so thank you very much for sharing that and for answering all the questions I have. I'm, I've exhausted all of them. So thank you so much for your time. Oh, my pleasure. God bless you and God bless all our seminarians and priests here. Thank you. God bless you.